I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of Allah, in the name of God. In Alhamdulillah, Musalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. My dear brothers and sisters and friends and respected guests, I greet you with the sincerest and warmest greetings of paradise, greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Which basically means may the peace and blessings of God of Allah be upon you all. So today's topic is a very dear topic to my heart because it's about our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon whom be peace. And there is so much to say about this great man and yet whatever I say today will not give it justice in any shape or form. In actual fact, if you were to dip your finger in the Atlantic Ocean and lift it, what I say is going to be on your finger and what you can say is going to be in the ocean. And this may sound like some kind of religious rhetoric, but I think after today's presentation, when you hear about this man, I think you all are going to fall in love again. Because if you don't fall in love with this man, I don't think you know what love is. And I'm going to argue today as well that if you reject this man, it's equivalent logically, philosophically, of rejecting that your mother gave birth to you. Because if you think about it, brothers and sisters and friends, you have no empirical proof that your mother gave birth to you. No one at home has a home DNA test kit, right? You have a birth certificate. Even if you claim you have videos and photos, well, you're not the same now, are you? So the point here is we don't have much empirical evidence. You just have the word of your mother, your father, the midwife, and maybe a birth certificate. And that's it. There's no empirical evidence. I've done this many times across the world and no one has proven to me that their mother actually gave birth to them from an empirical perspective. But they believe it to be true based on testimony. They say so of others, which is a fundamental source of knowledge. And also based on this deep intuition. Now, what I'm going to say is, if you reject the Prophet Muhammad upon be peace, that has more evidence than just testimony, then it's equivalent of rejecting that your mother gave birth to you. Now, we're going to cover four main things today. The first thing we're going to cover is the Prophet Muhammad's upon who be peace main message. What was his main message? The second thing we're going to cover is his character and his profound teachings. His character and his profound teachings. The third thing we're going to cover is that we could logically articulate a positive case for the fact that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace was a man of truth. Because he had a claim. He basically said he was the final messenger of God. Well, how do we assess this claim? We can't just be emotional about it using some kind of empty religious rhetoric. We have to provide some kind of substance. And I believe if you dwell into the life of our beloved Prophet upon whom be peace, what you would see is the truth, which is that he indeed was speaking the truth. Finally, if we have time, we're going to end with the fact that his message has changed your life. And you don't even know it. <laughs> I mean, some of us, you know, we're so ungrateful, really. We're standing on the shoulders of giants from an intellectual, spiritual, and social perspective. I would even argue the main reason we have an iPhone is because of the teachings of Muhammad upon whom be peace. Now this doesn't mean that you can find the algorithm in some kind of ancient tradition. No. What I'm saying is the social political values that emanated from the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace and from the Quran were implemented in Europe. Islamic Spain, for example. Medieval Spain. And medieval Spain had that culture of a convivencia of a beautiful coexistence where Muslims and non-Muslims could come together to look into the interconnecting principles of nature. And when the Christians took over Toledo, they found all of these manuscripts on science, physics, maths, astronomy, etc. And that's why Professor Arnold, Thomas Arnold, in his book, The Preaching of Islam on page 131, what does he say? Essentially, Islamic Spain was a milestone to the Renaissance. Islamic Spain was a milestone to the Renaissance. I'm not saying the Prophet's teachings upon him be peace were the primary cause, but he's part of that multi-causal model that if we didn't have those teachings implemented in Spain at that time, 
Europe may still be in the depth of darkness. Just study your history, people. Honestly, study it and you'll see. And we'll mention more of this later. So, what was his main message? Now, the main message of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace was essentially that we are here to worship God, to worship Allah. What does Allah mean? Allah means, according to some of the Arabic linguists, al ilah the deity. The name Allah is very unique. It has no gender, right? We don't believe God is a he. You may see this in Quranic translations, but he in Arabic can also mean it. So we don't have this kind of patriarchal view on the divine. If you were to look at the names and attributes of God, most of them can be categorized as female attributes, inverted commas. So it's a genderless name and it has no plural. It's a very unique name. That's why even in the Christian tradition, if you go to the kind of East, they still read the Bible in Aramaic and even in Arabic. And they call God from a biblical perspective in the following way. Allah, Allah, the deity, Allah. So it's not kind of a alien name, right? That only Muslims hold on to, right? And that you only hear on Fox News <laughs> with a man and a gun or something. Yeah? <laughs> that, that's not the reality. Muslims, you know, Allah is a beautiful name. And even in the Greek tradition, you know, they try to mention Allah and they call him Allah. You know, they, they actually make it sound a little bit more nasty. But Allah is a very soft name. Allah, Allah. It's like a uh, contraction and a, you know, it's like the heartbeat, right? Allah, Allah. Yeah, because the, the term Allah is such a beautiful name. It resonates with the thing that we consider a huge blessing, which is the heartbeat itself. I'm not saying that's the case, but this is my own little spin on things, yeah? Anyway, so we are here to worship God. Now you may think, what does that mean? Worship? I ain't worshiping nobody. I'm an individual. I'm so sufficient, right? I am king. What's in it for me? I'm a right jack. I'm not worshiping nobody. Who the hell is he? Right? We have this kind of arrogant attitude towards these concepts. But interestingly, in the Islamic tradition, worship doesn't just mean going to an institution every Sunday or when there's some kind of religious festival. But worship is a comprehensive topic and it means four major things. And listen very carefully. Number one, that you must love God, love Allah. Number two, you must know Allah. Number three, you must obey Allah. And number four, you must single out all acts of worship for Allah alone. Let's break this down. So why must you love God? Why must you love Allah? Well, there's actually a rational proof for this. Al-Ghazali, in the, the 11th century theologian, he wrote a book called Muhabba, Love and Intimacy. And he argues something profound concerning the love of God. He says, look, whether you like it or not, human beings love themselves. We love ourselves, right? Don't lie, bro. <laughs> You can tell, because that nice beard, you know, you spent time today. You love yourself, right? Right? Now this love is not a narcissistic ego type of love. It's not a narcissistic ego type of love. It's the type of love that Eric Fromm talks about. Eric Fromm was the famous psychologist. He wrote the book, The Art of Loving. Beautiful book. <coughs> Read it. You can download it for free online. It's... An amazing book and he describes that self-love is not egocentric type of love but it's the fact that you empathize with yourself that you understand you your feelings your desires your disposition that you don't want pain you want pleasure you want good for you I want good for me right that's the type of love Al-Ghazali is talking about so Al-Ghazali is saying if you have this type of love for yourself then rationally you have to love Allah you have to love God why because who created you? Who created the asbab, the physical causes in the universe in order for you to embrace pleasure and run away from pain? Who is the source of love? <coughs> who is the loving? Allah's name is what? Al-Wudud, coming from the Arabic word wud, which means a loving that is giving. This is Allah. Allah's name is the loving. Sometimes as Muslims we forget this, <laughs> right? We think Allah is this kind of, kind of crazy dragon and monster, right? And he's going to eat us up. You know, many children are brought up like, with this kind of misunderstanding of the divine reality. Allah's name is Al-Hudud, people. The loving. The excessively loving. He has a boundless love. So how can you not love someone like this? If I told you someone's coming into this room. Someone's coming into this room. 
and they are the most loving human being ever, you'd be like, you know what? I want to taste some of this love. I need some of this love. I want to know this person. It's intuitive. There's a deep desire for this. And this links to the second aspect of worship, which is to know Allah. Now let me un- make you understand what I mean by this. Now brothers and sisters and friends, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, for me it's irrelevant. I want to say something to you. I love you. Alright? This is our tradition. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom BP said, love for anas, love for humanity, what you love for yourself. This is a tradition you can be found in Bukhari. Love for anas, humanity, what you love for yourself. So I have this love for you. I was brought up like this, right? My dad's an amazing spiritualist kind of guy. When I used to hit the dollies, my dad used to take my hand and teach me to stroke them. We never had hardly any water pistols or guns at home. My dad was a pacifist from that perspective, right? I think that was from his negative experiences in the marine school in Greece. One of his best friends drowned or died from an army accident. So, you know, he's, he's a hippie, peaceful kind of guy. So it's part of the way I've been brought up. And also it's part of our Islamic tradition because the Prophet Muhammad upon him, he said, love for people what you love for yourself. He also said, there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. There is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. So I love you. But the question is, am I in love with you? No, unfortunately, maybe. I don't know, who knows? I, I'm not in love with you. Why? Because I don't know you. But bro, what's your name? Uzair, but for me to be in love with you, Uzair, I have to know you, right? I have to start knowing you. What makes you tick? Share some experiences. Understand your concepts, your ideas about life, right? Understand your disposition and your behavior, right? Then from Uzair, I could start calling you Janu, (laughs) right? (laughs) Which means in Urdu, like my life, yeah? Yeah? I could start calling you Janu, right? Do you see my point? No offense, bro. I know you're getting a bit biased. Oh, nice teeth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the point here is, it's the same with Allah. We have this intuitive love for the divine because He created us. But the way to fall in love with Allah is to know Him. And the way to know Him is to know, reflect on His names and attributes. He's Ar-Rahman, the intensely merciful. Al-Latif, He is the, the subtle He's Al-Khaliq, the creator. Al-Wali, he's the governor, the protector. So when you start reflecting his names and attributes and see how they affect your life, then you see some kind of divine interplay of names and attributes in your life. Consider the name and attribute Al-Hakim. God is the wise, meaning he has the picture. We only got the pixel, people. Allah has the picture. We just got the pixel. And you see this in your life. Who's looked into the past and said, Oh my God, who writes the script? <laughs> That's what I do all the time. I look into my past, right? I'm only 35, I'm not 70, but there you go. I'm older than most of you. I look into my past, I'm thinking, Who on earth writes the script, right? Because you know that some kind of dots have been connected that were totally outside of your control. Allah, Al-Hakim, the wise. And His wise divine plan will always, always manifest itself so you know you could understand Allah just by looking at your own life and reflecting on his names and attributes so we must love God we must know him now it follows we must obey him which is part of worship now you may be thinking I'm not obeying nobody that's a medieval narrative I ain't obeying anybody but the irony is if you don't obey Allah you're obeying something else anyway it's either your own limited concepts and ideas your ego or social pressure you're still obeying something Who's been on a plane before? Put your hand up. Everyone's been on a plane, apart from this poor guy. <laughs> well, how'd you get here, bro? <laughs> oh yeah, both, sorry. So, so, <laughs> I'm only picking on him because I know he's a rich Arab, yeah, so don't worry. <laughs> so, mashallah. So the point is, we all go here. <laughs> we got here with a plane, or we've gone somewhere with a plane. Now, you know when the, when the air hostess, or the man, what do you call a man air hostess? Same thing, right? Air steward. Air steward. Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We'll talk about that. <laughs> All right. The air steward or the air hostess, they basically say, there's turbulence, put your seatbelt on. What do you do automatically? You buckle. 
See both. There's an obedience here. Why? Because you don't have the knowledge they have. They understand how planes work, how turbulence works. They know about your safety more than you do. So you have an obedience. It's a rational type of obedience because you know they're the authority in this matter. You're not the authority. Well, that's the kind of obedience with Allah. You know Allah is the most highest authority on all matters, moral, ethical, right, spiritual. So therefore, even if you don't understand His command per se, you're going to obey because He's the authority. Don't be like the seven-year-old kid who accidentally <coughs> walks into a maths class. There's a mathematics professor writing calculus. And the seven-year-old kid says, what an idiot, right? Don't be like that kid. Because the kid hasn't understood that this guy, this professor is the authority in mathematics, right? So disobeying God in a way is like being like that seven-year-old. Or disobeying the air steward or the air hostess and saying, no, I'm not going to put my belt on. And then when the turbulence arrives or happens, you harm yourself, right? So the point here is, obeying God is a rational thing. But this doesn't mean you suspend your mind, because we say that the aql, the intellect in the Islamic tradition, coincides with the naql, which means the text. So when we look at a command, we don't blindly follow from the point of view that we don't try to understand what the command is. Of course we do, we try to understand right, what does God imply here? What is He telling us? What is the context? So we really truly understand what God wants from us, right? So there's the aspect of the intellect to understand what the command is, and then once we know this is the command, we obey, because it's the most rational thing to do. So all of these things form worship. And finally, the other part of worship is to single out all acts of worship to Him alone. What does this mean? You know what, you have to read the Qur'an to understand why Allah deserves to be worshipped. But I want to give you a starting point, so you could basically be planted in your heart and mind, so you can grow into the fruits of faith. Gratitude is a key to worship. A key point here is to understand the first chapter of the Qur'an is a summary of the whole of the Qur'an. And a summary of the whole of the Qur'an is the worship of Allah, the worship of God. And the first line of the first chapter that summarizes the whole Qur'an says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen All perfect gratitude and thanks belong to the Lord of everything. So gratitude is a key to worship. So how can we rationalize this? Well, think about this. I want you to think about this very carefully, okay? There is something in your life that you freely receive that you don't earn and you don't own. I repeat, there is something in your life that you freely receive that you don't earn and you don't own. If it's true, brothers and sisters and friends, there is something that you receive that you don't earn and you don't own, but yet it's so precious. How should that make you feel? Grateful, right? So what is this thing? It's every moment of your conscious existence. You don't own your life. You can't even create a fly. You haven't earned it. What can you do to earn such an amazing thing that you have no power over? It's given to you all the time, so we should be in a state of gratitude. So don't be like the one who receives 10 pounds every day and after a year, you start thanking the 10 pounds and not the one that gave it to you. Another way of looking at this, brothers and sisters, concerning gratitude is to think about that you can never count your blessings. The Qur'an says this. Allah says in the Qur'an, you can never enumerate the blessings of Allah, the blessings of God. And I tried to find an example to bring this to light and I think I found one. You know what it is? Your heartbeat. Your heartbeat. If I told you that you have only a hundred heartbeats left and to gain another extra hundred heartbeats you have to give me a mountain of gold, you would probably spend the first hundred heartbeats to find the gold to give it to me to get more heartbeats. That's how precious one single heartbeat is. So precious, right? It's an amazing blessing. Just sit in a room with no phone, no rubbish, no TV and just Listen to your heartbeat with a stethoscope for a few minutes. I'm telling you, you'll be shocked. You're thinking, I'm so vulnerable. Life is so precious. You be Actually, say stop to your heartbeat. <laughs> They'll just ignore you, man. You can't even control it. You think it's yours. You think you're in control of these things. Every heartbeat is a blessing. And you know what's interesting? 
You can never count all your heartbeats in your life. As the Quran said, you can never enumerate all of your blessings. And that's so true. Because in the first two years of your life, you have backlog. Because you don't know how to count. When you're sleeping, you can't count. When you're eating, drinking, playing with friends, you can't count. So it's true, you can never count the blessings of Allah. So be grateful. And this is not some kind of Islamic talk. This is universal spiritual language. If you go to any bookstore and pick up any secular spiritualist book, they say, you want to be happy? Then be grateful. So gratitude is the key to worship. I wanted to spend time on this, brothers and sisters, so you know what his key message was. is the worship of Allah. And just to end this section, remember, if you're not worshipping Allah, you're worshipping something else anyway. Because think about this. If I asked you what you love the most, what do you want to know the most, what do you obey, and who are you grateful to all the time, well, that's your object of worship. We all worship something else. Allah, society, politician, musicians, Justin Bieber, right? How many 20 million followers on Twitter? Right? Oh, sign my hijab. <laughs> yeah. You know, sign, sign my blouse, right? I don't believe, you know, Justin Bieber's following me on Twitter. Always want to get to know Justin, reading the magazines, loving Justin, right? This is worship. She's not even a very good singer anyway. <laughs> Wait, I say something funny? So, you have to understand you're going to worship something else anyway. And the Quran mentions this very powerfully. Chapter 39, verse 29. And listen to this analogy from your Creator. It's mind-blowing. Allah says, Con consider the condition of two people. One person has many masters... And they're all quarreling. And the other person, he has only one master. Whose condition's best? Allah is telling us, if you don't worship the one master Allah, loving Him, knowing Him, obeying Him, you're going to worship so many different masters. Your, your society, peer pressure, your ego, your desires, your friends, the culture, politicians, right? Celebrities, whatever. You're going to be worshipping something else. But Allah is saying... Allah is the one who knows you better than you know yourself. Allah knows Hamza better than Hamza knows Hamza. And Allah loves Hamza more than my own mother does. That's what the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace taught me. So make your choice. You're worshipping all these things from the definition that we just discussed, or you're worshipping the, worshipping the one that deserves worship. So, that was his main message. Now let's go to his character and his teachings. Now, I want to start off by talking about how the Prophet Muhammad upon whom peace dealt with dialogue and discussion because it's so important. We're at university here and we need to teach and remind ourselves about what's the Islamic ethic of discourse. Now, very interestingly, the pharaonic character in the Quran is the worst character. He's like one down from Satan. <laughs> yeah? Pharaoh, he thought he was God. He was the greatest polytheist because he attributed divinity to himself. And through that polytheism, he oppressed people and killed children, and he was an oppressor. He's one of the worst characters. But what does Allah say to Moses? What does Allah say to Moses, who was the prophet dealing with Pharaoh? What does Allah say to him in order to treat him nicely and to talk to him in a good way? This is what Allah says. Allah says, and speak to him mildly. Arabic, layina. Speak to him mildly. So that he may accept admonition, the advice. This is the worst creature, right? The worst tyrant and oppressor. He's worse than any oppressor you know today. From the west or the east. He's the worst. And yet what does Allah say to Moses? Allah says, Layyina, speak mildly, compassionately to Moses. The classical scholar Imam Al-Qurtubi, he said concerning this verse, if Moses was commanded to speak mildly to Pharaoh, then it is even more appropriate for others to follow this command when speaking to others and when commanding the good and forbidding the wrong. Do we do this though? You know, we're so quick to go like, ah, you know, evil dictator, oppressor, right? But we forget the etiquette of the Quran, which is even to the worst type of people to speak softly and compassionately. 
These are the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. These are the teachings that he carried because he was the carrier of the message of the Qur'an. And what's very interesting is the Qur'an tells us when we discourse and dialogue with all people, all types of people, Muslim and non-Muslim, to do it with a way that is beautiful and with wisdom. As Allah says in the Qur'an, invite to the way of your Lord with hikmah, wisdom and beautiful preaching and discuss with them in a way that is better. The famous grammarian and classical scholar Imam Jamakhshari, he said, discussing with them in a way that is better means using the best type of argumentation, which is the method of kindness and gentleness without gruffness and without any harshness. And we saw this in the softness of the Prophet's heart. Allah speaks to the Prophet and he says the following words. And by the mercy of God, you dealt with them, his companions, gently. Had you been severe and harsh-hearted, they would have broken away from you. Now this is very key for you to understand. When it comes to discourse and dialogue with other people, if people are not flocking towards you, there's something wrong. If people are not flocking towards you, there is something wrong. This was the softness of the Prophet's heart, upon whom be peace. That people would run towards him. They wouldn't run away from him. Especially when it was matters of dialogue and discussion and discourse. So as Muslims we should understand this and internalize this. And as non-Muslims we should understand that our role model, our role model is the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Not some angry bearded youth that you see on the street sometimes, right? So this shows the softness of the Prophet's heart. And... <clears throat> This is why we consider the Prophet Muhammad upon him to be so merciful. We believe that he was a mercy to mankind. The Quran says that the Prophet upon whom be peace was sent down as a mercy to everything. As a mercy to everything. And we see this manifest in his teachings. Consider the teachings on mercy. Amazing teachings on mercy. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said, The merciful one, meaning God, shows mercy to those who are themselves merciful to others. So show mercy to whatever is on earth, then he who is in the heaven will show mercy to you. And we know this. The Prophet Muhammad upon him peace taught us about the prostitute who fed a thirsty dog. Where did the prostitute go when she died? You know the story. Where did she go? Paradise. The prostitute fed a thirsty dog and she was given paradise. Because of her mercy. This is powerful. This is a religion of mercy, a religion of hope. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace also said, God is kind and compassionate. And he loves kindness and compassion. I have all the references here. Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Bukhari. It's all in the traditions. We also have a tradition where the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said, He is not of us who has no compassion for our little ones and does not honor our old ones. So we see here teachings of mercy that were supposed to be people of mercy, people of rahmah, which really rahmah, rahmah doesn't mean mercy. It really means loving compassion. Actually, it means intense loving compassion. Don't get confused with the English language. Rahmah means intense loving compassion. This is who Muslims are supposed to be. People who have intense, loving compassion for others. Forget others, for animals too. Like dogs. Cats. You know the companions of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace? One of them used to feed the ants. There was an ant hill near his house. And they would ask him, why are you feeding them? Do you know what he said? Do you know what he said? He said, because on the day of judgment, I don't want the ants to take me to account that I didn't fulfill the rights of the neighbor. Look at the kind of outlook mindset of these people. They internalized these teachings. It wasn't as abstract theology. It internalized and trickled into their own hearts. What about love? The Prophet Muhammad spoke about love. You know our religion is a religion of love? But sometimes it sounds like a religion of hate, huh? It's really a religion of love. Because if you love Allah, then you manifest this mercy to everybody else. 
and you hate the things that are barrier to that love. This religion is a religion of love. We're trying to make it a religion of hate. Yes, it's loving to hate the things that are barrier to love. That's why we have the concept of loving things for the sake of Allah and hating things for the sake of Allah. But if you understand that tradition deeply, those things that you hate are barrier to love. It's very unloving to love the things that are hateful, right? That's an unloving thing to do. Yeah, I love everything. I even love hate. <laughs> Do you see? It doesn't make sense. So it's actually loving to hate the things that are barrier to love. And look what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, Love for people what you love for yourself. The Arabic is anas, it means people, humanity in general. The Prophet Muhammad taught us, upon whom be peace, when a man loves his brother, he should tell him that he loves him. Unfortunately, sometimes in our Asian subcontinent communities, we haven't heard the word love at home, ever. When was the last time your dad said he loves you? This is a sad state of affairs. We've basically neglected this profound practice of our Prophet, which is compassion and which is love. That's why we end up being sometimes, frankly, and I do apologize, a bunch of scumbags. Because we're part, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And then all we learn is to point the finger. And then we forget that three fingers are pointing back. We need to build houses of love. Houses of compassion. This is the home of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. You know, you command justice, you command, you know, we have to obey Allah and you command Islam around the world. But yeah, it's not even a home. <laughs> you think God's stupid? You think God is stupid? That's what you think, right? You think we always point the finger. Look what's happening in Syria. Look what's happening at home. Islamophobia, all of this rubbish. But you got racism at home. You got no love at home. You got tribalism at home. You got ego at home. You got oppression at home. And you think you're going to solve world problems. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys, we're messed up, man. You know, we use a spyglass. It's time to use the mirror. Honestly, we use the spyglass, it's time to use the mirror. Al mu'min wa miratul mu'min. The believer is a mirror of another believer. When you see blemish on the mirror, you don't wipe the mirror, you wipe yourself. Inna Allah la yughayyiru. Indeed, Allah will not change the situation of a people until they change unfussahim what's within themselves. This is so true. This is so true. We always demand from others where's the Muslim rights? Get lost. Get lost. When was the last time the Prophet asked for his rights? And he deserves more rights than you. If you study his tradition, he never demanded anything from himself, not even food. He was a man of giving other people their rights. But we would say, where's my rights? Where's my... You need to raise the spiritual moral bar, people. Where's your rights? I'm not denying them for you, don't worry. But what I'm trying to make you understand is that a Muslim is one that doesn't care about his right. He cares about others. He's selfless. He understands he's not an individual. He's a individual. He's part of the whole society. Because your birth was dependent on nearly an infinite number of variables that were external to yourself. So you understand how interconnected human beings are. Not like, oh, he's an Islamophobe. Oh, what's happening to us? What's happening to you? Well, here, yeah, this is important. Have the right outlook. The prophetic outlook. Sunnah, brother, which means the prophetic way. Follow the sunnah. Okay, where's the psychology of the sunnah? Where's the psychology of the prophetic way? Which is... We're going to tolerate people's harms. We're going to have forbearance. Forbearance means patience against aggression. Patience against aggression at the time of calamity, at the time of aggression. And I'm going to talk about forbearance in a minute. But let me talk to you now about the humility of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. He said, do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians praise the son of Mary, Jesus, alayhi salam. For I am only a slave. So call me the slave of God and his apostle. It wasn't about him, it was about the message. They asked his wife, Aisha, may God be, may God be pleased with her. What did the Prophet Muhammad upon him do at home? And look what he said. Look what she said. He was like any other human being, cleaning, mending his garment, milking the goat, mending his shoes, serving himself, and being of service to the family, till he hears the call of prayer, then he goes and pray. How many Muslim men in our own homes do we do these things? 
You would never milk a goat. <laughs> milk a girl, they'll be divorced at home. Serve your wife? My God, it's almost impossible, yeah? You know, we have a kind of patriarchy at home, isn't it? You know, we need to start doing some things, you know? As best as we can. Uh, by the way, I'm not perfect either, yeah? Because I'm not saying I do these things. So this is a lesson and an advice to myself too. But it shows that the Prophet Muhammad he was a human being, not a human doing. He was in a state of being that was a state of mercy to others and to his family. Mending the goat, serving his household. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, once saw a man who was trembling with fear. Because you know, he's the Prophet. He was trembling with fear like this. Listen to the words of the Prophet. He said, relax. I'm not a king. I'm the son of an Arab woman who eats jerk to meat. Meaning I'm just like you. In a contemporary sense, we be relax, bruv. I'm just like you. I go to KFC. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Do you see my point? He's, try, he's trying to show that he's, he was humble. Yeah, he, he used to make supplications about his own humility. He would say to Allah, Oh Allah, oh God, make me live humbly, make me die humbly, and gather me among the humble on the day of resurrection. And he was so modest from this perspective because if you study the book Shama'il Tirmidhi, which is about the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, do you know what he would say? He would say, oh what a wonderful curry vinegar is. He used to dip his bread in curry, in vinegar, as a curry. If you had that as a curry, there will be chaos at home. But this how amazing and modest and his level of asceticism is phenomenal. Oh, what a wonderful curry vinegar is. He dip bread into vinegar as a curry. You know, sometimes for two months or for months, he would be on aswadain. You know what that is? Just water and dates. You try living on water and dates for a month. And we believe this was the best of all creation. And he taught us in the famous tradition that it's only a few morsels that is enough to keep your back straight. And if you're going to eat, then it's one third for food, one third for liquid, and one third for gas, essentially, for air. You know this prophetic tradition, we cut it in half. We forget the first part. We think, yeah, I'm going to eat, I'm going to follow the prophetic practice. One third food, one third liquid, one third air. No, no, no. Listen to what the prophetic tradition says. A few morsels are enough to keep your back straight. And if you're going to eat, then do the following. Which shows that overeating is actually a spiritual disease. You know, it's a very bestial thing, isn't it? It's to eat all the time and graze. That's what animals do. It's true, isn't it, right? And that's why one of the worst things to fill is your own stomach. The Prophet Muhammad upon him said the worst, one of the worst vessels to fill is your own stomach. We overeat as human beings. You know, I heard this from a sheikh on YouTube and he, he no, but he, he, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a nice quote. And he made a beautiful point quoting another sheikh. <laughs> and he said, what would you say about the person who eats, eats once a day? And the sheikh says, the scholar says, he is of the Anbiya, of the prophets. What about the one who eats twice a day? He's of the Salihin, he's of the pious people. What if the person eats three times a day? He said, build for him a trough. He's like an animal, right? It's part of a spiritual tradition. You know, the, one of the worst things to fill is your stomach. So the Prophet Muhammad upon whom was, was very, very modest, very, very humble. For example, Anas ibn Malik, he, he said that the Prophet wasallam would be invited to eat barley bread and rancid fat and he would eat it. Right, he would be invited to eat rancid fat and he would go and he would entertain the host. Do you see the point here? This is phenomenal. This is modesty. Some of you, you won't even... You, you'd be only dead going to KFC, for example. You know, we're too posh these days. I have to go to Nando's or whatever, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not... It's, you're too, you know... Your nose is too high. Too, too upper brow for this, right? But this is wrong. And I know of friends and family, they won't go to someone else's house just because they don't like the food. But the Prophet upon whom be peace, who is our role model... He would go to even a place where they would offer him rancid fat.
Following on from this, we understand that the Prophet, upon whom he peace, not only was a man of mercy, love, and modest in humility, but he was a man of justice. For example, the Prophet, upon whom he peace, if you study his treaties with other minorities like the Christians and the Jews, you'd be like, this is phenomenal. This predates any modern conception of treaties. For example, if you study the 16th century reformation and the 80 years wars and the 30 year wars and the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day and the treaties of Westphalia and all of these things, right? You don't understand that Islam had this 1500, sorry, nearly a thousand years before. The Prophet Muhammad, upon whom peace, he understood that there were different people living amongst him and they had amazing, just, loving, and compassionate treaties with them, which predates. Any Western conception of treaties, study this for yourself. When the Prophet Muhammad upon whom peace establishes amazing justice and harmony, we, I'm saying we because I'm a European Brit with a Greek background, we were still basically drinking other people's blood. This is a historical fact, it's not rhetoric, go read it for yourself. And I want to read you one of the treaties, it's called the Treaty of Najran, it's with the Christians of Najran. And, it, and it's as follows. And what's interesting is that the people of Najran, they were persecuted by their own Christians, the Byzantines. <laughs> that was the irony. But yet, Islam came to help these people. So here is the treaty. The lives of the people of Najran and its surrounding area, their religion, their land, their property, cattle, and those of them who are present or absent, their messengers and their places of worship are under the protection of Allah and guardianship of His Prophet. Their present state shall neither be interfered with, nor their rights meddled with, nor their idols deformed. Take note, Isis. No bishop shall be removed from his office. The intention being that no change in whatever state everyone is shall be made. Neither the people shall be punished for any past crime or murder, nor shall they be compelled to do military service. If any of the people of Najran demands the rights, justice shall be done between the plaintiff and the respondent. Neither oppression shall be allowed to be perpetrated on them, and they shall, be, they shall not be permitted to oppress anyone. This is phenomenal. I don't think you find any of these writings in that period. Taking care of minorities, understanding issues concerning treaties. Now what's very important is to understand not only the justice of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace, <coughs> but the fact that he had hilm, forbearance. This is kind of the kind of landmark, the landmark of the character of the Prophet ﷺ. He had so much forbearance, patience with aggression, patience with people who wanted to harm him and, 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 and essentially murder him and kill him and annihilate him. For example, we know that the Prophet had to go to battle. The Arabs were crazy people at that time. They would fight over a camel. They had a 40 year war over a camel. A camel people, yeah? They would fight over a camel, spill the blood of the fellow human beings over an animal that they would slaughter anyway to eat. The irony. They would fight over a camel. The egocentrism in that society was like, was, it was like you reached the summit. Now, the Arabs wanted to annihilate the Muslims and the non-Muslims that were living together peacefully. They wanted to annihilate them. So the Prophet upon him be peace had to protect himself. So he engaged in war. And his tooth had been broken and his face was cut. And his blood was dripping. And his companions asked him to curse the aggressors. The companion said, go curse the aggressors. Because the dua, the supplication of a prophet will be answered. Even in that state of crisis, of physical harm, of being endangered. Because these polytheist Arabs were hell-bent on annihilating the Muslims and the non-Muslims of the society, what did he say? This is what he said. I was not sent to curse, but I was sent as a summoner and as a mercy. Oh God, guide my people for they do not know. This is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anas ibn Malik, he said that I serve the Messenger of Allah for 10 years and he never said to me once off he did not say about anything I had done, why did you do it? Or about anything I had not done, why didn't you do it? Now let me give you a, a test. 
Spend a year with someone. Your children. Write down how many times you've said, oh, oh, oh man, my God. Come on, for God's sake. And count how many times you said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? But I told you to do this. Count how many times you do it in a year. Forget a year, a week. I'm a parent, I know. I do it so many times. This young man served him, the Prophet wasallam, for 10 years. Not once did the Prophet say, off. Not once did the Prophet say, why didn't you do this? Or why did you do that? Not once. To be honest, that's impossible. That's a miracle in itself. Just try it out. And you know what? Even if you tried it out, you'd be consciously aware all the time not to say something, just to try and pass the test. And that would basically, you know, consciously just basically make you not be able to do anything because you're so careful not to say off just to win and pass the test. But this came naturally for the Prophet wasallam. So much forbearance, so much mercy, so much love for people. Now there's a really interesting story that I want to recite to you or, or relate to you which concerns the forbearance of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. Now basically, once a man was demanding a repayment for a debt, and he got hold of the Prophet Muhammad and he behaved very badly, he actually pulled him so much, it left a mark. Now the Prophet's companion was there, and he chased him off and spoke harshly to him. But look what the Prophet said upon him be peace. He said, he and I needed something else from you. Command me to repay well, and command him to ask for the debt well. The Prophet repaid the loan upon whom be peace and gave a little extra due to there was some kind of delay. And the person who pulled his neck became a Muslim. Because one of the signs of prophethood was forbearance. Being patient with someone is an aggressor. And the man, also known as Zaid, said, there were only two remaining signs of prophethood which I had not yet recognized in Muhammad or noticed. Forbearance, overcoming quick-temperedness and extreme ignorance, only increasing him in, in forbearance. I tested him for these and I found him as described. He was forbearance against aggression and extreme ignorance. Even the Quran says, when you see the ignorant, what do we say? Salam. Give a word of peace. Give some nice words to people who are arrogant and ignorant to you. Now, Finally, on, the, on this section of the Prophet Sallallahu character, let's talk about forgiveness. Now, think about this scenario. Imagine for 13 and more years, you had people who you loved wanting to annihilate you, kill you, oppress you. They actually killed your beloved companions. They went to war with you. They tortured your companions, sometimes in front of you. They boycotted you. They almost made you starve to death. They stoned you. They nearly broke your neck by stepping on your neck while you're praying. They slandered you. Imagine this happened for 13 years and more. Death, calamity, chaos, torture, oppression. And say for example, after that period of time, you now had power over them. They were at your mercy. What would you do? Well, many of us, I know what we would do. We will take revenge. It's all about me. My wife passed away because of your oppression. My young children passed away, which is true. The young children of the Prophet Muhammad upon him passed away. His wife Khadija passed away. Some scholars and historians say it was because of the pressure of the calamities of prophethood. His beloved companions were tortured and abused. He was tortured and abused. Made to starve. The famous boycott of Mecca as we know. We would take revenge. But what did he say? <coughs> he said, when some of the companions wanted to take revenge, what did he say to them? He said, today is a day of piety, piety, a day of faithfulness and a day of loyalty. And what day was this? When now he had con the conquest of Mecca. He conquered Mecca without any war. He conquered Mecca, and although some of his companions wanted revenge, he said this is a day of piety, a day of faithfulness, and a day of loyalty. There was this general universal pardon. Yes, there were some people who had to be taken to court, and they had to be punished for certain crimes. Like you have to, because if you don't punish for certain crimes, then it's not really merciful. 
Because you have to sometimes show a clear signal to people that if you do these type of crimes, these are the punishments. Because if you don't do that, then you're basically allowing people to get away scot-free and basically allow them and give them another chance to basically destroy your society and harm other people. So it's an act of mercy to take some people to court and give them due punishment. But there was a general universal pardon. It was a day of loyalty, a day of piety, and a day of faithfulness. This was the mercy of the Prophet Although he had the power to do what he wanted, but it wasn't about him, it was about the message, it was about the divine message. You know what's very interesting? As he was coming into Mecca, his, where was his head? His chin, it was on his, the saddle of his riding beast. Because he was, he was overwhelmed with humility. Because he knew this had nothing to do with him. This was God's grace. But many of us, we would walk into Mecca. Now who's the bad boy? Yeah, <laughs> I'm the gangster now, right? That's what we would do. But this is not our tradition. Because the heart of the Prophet ﷺ was a pure heart. Just like the heart of Salahuddin Ayubi when he took over Jerusalem and he didn't massacre people. Because his tarbiya, his development, spiritual development was one of no hatred, no jealousy, no kind of egocentrism. And you don't do these actions. You don't, you don't slaughter people if you have that type of heart. Their hearts were in the right place. So the Prophet ﷺ was a man of forbearance and a man of mercy and forgiveness. Now there's so much more to say, but let me end this section by now moving on to the other section, which is about how do we logically prove that the Prophet ﷺ was actually speaking the truth. Now this is where the logic and rationality comes in. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, he had a claim. He said that he was the final messenger of God. Well, let's assess this claim together by understanding his life. Let's do this together. So the first assessment is, well, maybe he was lying. Maybe him saying that he was the final messenger of God is based on lies. We know this can't be the case. The first point is that the people who hated him the most still called him the trustworthy. The people who hated him the most, who want to annihilate the message of 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 oneness, of monotheism, they, they still called him the trustworthy. They called him the trustworthy. And if you look at the psychological profile of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, his psychological profile was amazing. Because you cannot even see him and say that he was a liar, just based upon his psychology. Because a liar usually lies for some kind of worldly gain. He had no money, no riches. We already mentioned this for months to be on dates and water. He went to give the message in a town in Arabia and he was stoned by owls by children and spat on where blood was running down his legs and his feet were stuck to the sandals. And the angels gave him the option to basically get the mountains and wipe that town out. But he said no, no. Because he wants people from this community to end up worshipping Allah and praying. That was the mercy of the Prophet upon whom be peace. He had all of this calamity. How can you call him a liar? He gained nothing. He just wanted people to admit their own internal reality, what they know, which is there is no deity of worship but the deity, but God, but Allah. Not worshipping myself, not worshipping my ego or society, but worshipping the one that created me, the one that deserves to be worshipped. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace was offered women, power, land, riches, gold. He rejected all of this just for the simple message, worship God, don't worship yourselves. Worship God, don't worship idols. Worship God, don't worship your ego. He gained nothing. Absolutely nothing. He went to war. He was fought against. He was so hungry because of the boycott of Mecca, he had to tie two stones to his stomach. His wife passed away, his children passed away, his companions were murdered in front of him. And you're saying he maintained a liar? For what reason? Wallahi, by God, to claim he's a liar is to claim your mother never gave birth to you. Because look what he went through. Look at the evidence at hand. It is no wonder Montgomery Watt, the emeritus professor in Arabic and Islamic studies, he said the following 
in his book, Muhammad at Mecca. He said, his readiness to undergo persecution for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as a leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement, all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Because if you call this man an imposter, you've got to deny your mom gave birth to you. Now one would argue, fine, maybe he wasn't a liar, but he was deluded. Which means that he thinks he was speaking the truth, but it was based on a falsehood. Well, this is not true at all, because when we analyze the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon me peace, we will see that there were so many incidents in his life that he could have used to support his delusion. For example, there was a solar eclipse. At the time of the solar eclipse, what happened? His son Ibrahim passed away. The Arabs thought, you must be the Prophet. Because look what God did. He made the solar eclipse happen and your son passed away. How did the Prophet reply? He said, the sun and moon do not eclipse because of the death of someone from the people. But these are the signs of Allah. These are the signs of God. Like the sun and moon are signs for his greatness, his wisdom and his majesty. A deluded person would have said, yes, I must be the Prophet. Look what's happened. My son died and... There's an eclipse. But he said, no, this didn't happen for anybody's death. These are the signs of Allah. And there are many incidents in his life that he could have used if he was deluded to support his delusion, but he never. What's interesting, apart from the teachings that we've mentioned previously, what about his prophecies? Do you know, if you study the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace, you'd be like, wow, how, how can you not say this person is a prophet? He must be a prophet. Now listen to some of his prophecies. Now, 600 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, the Mongols invaded Muslim lands. Now they were an eco-catastrophe. They would kill everything. <laughs> yeah, even the kids would kill. The horses would kill. They were like an army that just like ravaged everything. They burnt books, spilt bloods. They ransacked Baghdad. It was just absolutely full of bloodshed. And this was around 1258. Now what was interesting is that the Mongols were non-Arabs and they had flat noses, small eyes, and their boots would be made of hair. The Mongols had fur over their boots and, they, and it used to be called Degti, Degti. Now this is 600 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look what he said. He said, the hour will not be established, meaning the day of judgment won't come. The hour will not be established till you fight from the, among the non-Arabs. They will be of red faces, flat noses, small eyes, the face will be like shields, and the shoes will be of hair. If that's not the Mongols, then I'm from Nigeria. <laughs> <coughs> Another prophecy which I find amazing and fascinating, which is the competition in the construction of tall buildings. A man asked the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, now tell me of the hour. Now we, know, we know this man was the angel Gabriel. The Prophet replied, the one asked knows no more of it than the one asking. Then he said, tell me about its signs. And then he said that you see barefoot, unclothed Bedouins competing in construction of tall buildings. This is very interesting. The Arabs at the time would build in the ground. Because it was so hot. It's cool if you build in the ground. If you look at the civilizations around the time of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, it was the Byzantines and the Persians. They would build the buildings, right? But the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace says that it would be the barefoot, unclothed desert Arab that would compete in tall buildings. So it's quite irrational from an empirical perspective to even make that claim. And what's interesting, only recently in the last, what, 50, 60 years, that you had the barefoot, unclothed Bedouin Arab now building high buildings. You have the tribes, the Bedouins of UAE building the highest building over 800 feet. It's called the Burj Khalifa. And when it was finished, the Saudis, another competing barefoot, unclothed Bedouin tribe in the, to, with regards to the origin, basically announced that they're going to build a taller building, which is one kilometer high. The barefoot, unclothed Bedouin Arab competing in tall buildings just recently 60 years ago there are so many more prophecies by the way there are other prophecies for example 
where the Prophet upon him said the time would not come until they would basically have piercing holes in the mountains of Mecca. Right? Piercing holes in the mountains of Mecca. Go to Mecca. I, was, I went to Hajj, the pilgrimage, two years ago. And you see, you walk through the mountains, there's big huge holes in the mountains. And they've made them for like walkways and runways, or whatever you call it, right? So many other prophetic traditions. So many, just study them for yourself. There's another prophetic tradition that says that dishes will speak. <laughs> you know? Satellite dishes, they communicate. Dishes will speak. Another one, I forgot the Arabic term, but it's the distance between your thumb and your finger. That people will talk between their thumb and their finger. This is the universal sign for what? It's not a banana, it's a phone. <laughs> yeah? You know, there's so many amazing ones. And this is, these are very clear. It's not like Nostradamus' so-called prophecies. If you study Nostradamus, so ambiguous, you know, you can interpret it 50 million ways. But these are very clear prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. So, from this perspective, his teachings, his psychological profile, the fact that he couldn't be deluded, his prophecies, that he couldn't be a liar or deluded, he must have been speaking the truth. It's no wonder Dr. William Draper in the history of intellectual development in Europe, he said, four years after the death of Justinian, AD 569, was born in Mecca, in Arabia, the man of all men, who exercised the greatest influence upon the human race, to be the religious head of many empires, to guide the daily life of one third of the human race, may perhaps justify the title of messenger of God. In the last five minutes I have, brothers and sisters, let's talk about his impact. I already mentioned to you the concept of tolerance and coexistence with his Treaty of Madran. What about how he treated the most persecuted minorities in the world? Who are the most persecuted minorities in the world? I said it was the Jewish people, right? According to history. The Jewish people. But look how the Prophet Muhammad, the point of peace, treated the Jews. Look what the Jewish historian Amnon Cohen said in his book, A World Within. He's got a two volume book called A World Within. He's an academic. He said, no one interfered with the internal organization or the external cultural and economic activities. The Jews of Ottoman Jerusalem enjoyed religious and administrative autonomy within the Islamic State. And as a constructive dynamic element of the local economy and society, they could and actually did contribute to its functioning. This, the Ottomans, you know, if you study the Majalla, the kind of book that they had, these were the principles of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Even the popular historian Karen Armstrong, she says, the Muslims had established a system that enabled Jews, Christians and Muslims to live in Jerusalem together for the first time. So this should give us some, some signs or some indicators to, and driving, you know, a driving force to look into the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Look what the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said in the Treaty of Medina with the Jews. It's amazing. He said, it is incumbent on all the Muslims to help and extend sympathetic treatment to the Jews who have entered into an agreement with us. Neither an oppression of any type should be perpetrated on them, nor their enemy be helped against them. This is our tradition, people. Rahma, mercy, justice, convivencia, coexistence, dealing with minority rights way before me, us in the West even developed this, right? Your Christians were killing Christians like four, five hundred years ago. <laughs> forget other forget other religions, <laughs> right? You know the Jacobites they'll get annihilated by the Byzantines. The Greek Church was killing its own Christian people. Yeah, you know Christianity doesn't have a bloodless history. It's quite bloody, man. Just study it. I've been studying this because I have to. I'm doing a postgraduate philosophy in <laughs> in, in London, and it's been bloody. And this is why I empathize with. Western intellectuals, because all they know is what happened in Western history. Catholic Church was there, blood chaos, right? No progression, no freedom of thought and expression. So what they do, they superimpose that limited experience on other religions. So it's our duty just to say, you know, make, look, look, at, look at our history. It's, okay, I'm not trying to glorify our history, by the way, because that's what we do as Muslims, we over glorify our history. There is blood and there's chaos and oppression in it as well. But at least what we can say is, the good parts were because people followed Islam. The bad parts is because they never followed Islam. And also, this kind of attitude towards minorities affected the companions of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Take for example the Treaty of Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, he was like 
the key companion of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And listen to the treaty of Umar with the Christians. He said, this is the protection which the servant of Allah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the faithful, grants to the people of Palestine. Thus, protection is for their lives, property, church, cross, for the healthy and sick, for all the co-religionists, co-religionists, in this way that the churches shall not be turned into dwelling houses, nor will they be pulled down, nor any injury be done to them or to the enclosures, nor to their cross, and nor will anything be deducted from their wealth, no restrictions shall be made regarding their religious ceremonies. This was the Treaty of Umar. Find me a treaty like this in the 8th and 9th century in Europe. Find me, please. Please, I'll g give you a gift. <laughs> Honestly, because you won't be able to find it. Find me such treaties like this in Europe. You won't. And this is why we must study this man. Even the patriarch Theodosius of Jerusalem in the 9th century, he said the Saracens, which meant the Muslims, show us great goodwill. They allow us to build our own churches and to observe our own customs without hindrance. So this is the justice, the impact of the Prophet Muhammad. It resonates throughout history, from the 8th century to the 16th century and beyond. What about interracial cooperation? The Quran teaches us people who were created we created you from a single man and a single woman and made it your races and tribes that you should recognize one another. In God's eyes, the most honored of you are the ones who are most mindful of him. God is all-knowing, all-aware. The Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, taught us all mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority of a non-Arab, and no non-Arab has any superiority of an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority of a black, nor a black has any superiority of a white except by piety and good actions. And it's no wonder the famous historian A.J. Toynbee said, the extinction of race consciousness as between Muslims is one of the outstanding achievements of Islam in the contemporary world. There is, as it happens, a crying need for the propagation of this Islamic virtue. Now, obviously, we don't follow these practices ourselves. We have to re-internalize the practice of racial, interracial cooperation because at the moment, you know, Pakistanis can't marry Pakistanis, yeah? Kashmiris can't marry Punjabis. Nigerians can't marry Afghanis. Afghanis can't marry Moroccans. Because we have this, this excessive, nasty, ridiculous animal nationalism. That's what animals do. They're very nationalistic. You go to my jungle, I'm going to eat you up, yeah? That's what it is. It's, you know, we don't believe in borders. You know, some, some colonialist drew lines on a map. And we define ourselves by those lines. You know, my dad is Greek, right? And he has more just justification to be proud of where he's from than you. No offense. Well, Bangladesh is 80 years old, 60 years old, Pakistan, 1930s, 40s. You know, these, these are man-made states, man. No previous civilization, really. Yeah? All made up. Right? Some guy drew lines on a map. At least the Greeks, six, what, 6,000 years tradition. Plato, Aristotle. You study at school, Right? <coughs> Yeah? Name, name, name me some Pakistani guy you study at school, man. <laughs> no offense. I'm not saying this in a bad way. I'm trying to make you realize we have this excessive pride of this false human notion of nationalism. We're human beings. We all bleed in the same color. We smile in the same color. And we cry in the same color. And Islam taught us that this nationalistic tendency is irrelevant. And my dad had more justification because he's Greek. But he even taught me there are no such thing as borders. They're man-made. <coughs> That my mom's a refugee from 1974 invasion of Cyprus, the Turks. And my mom should be an inspiration to you. Because she allowed Turks in my house. My sister was engaged to a Turk for 10 years. And they treat him better than they treat their own sons. That's an Islamic virtue that my mom had. But we don't have this virtue at home. Because you're from the wrong tribe. Shame on us. And we complain about Islamophobia and racism, but there's racism in our own community. It doesn't work that way, people. It doesn't work that way. We need to re-internalize this Islamic ethic of that we're the same. We're the same. Pakistani, Bengali, Nigerian, we're the same. And I'm not 
saying intellectually, I'm saying here in your heart, what your heart says before you say anything. That's the important thing. Because you may have a black brother that converts to Islam, everyone says, Allahu Akbar, God is great. Then he's a practicing brother, very ethical brother in the community. Then after 10 years of showing his good ethical practice, he goes to a Pakistani uncle and says, Uncle, you were there when I converted to Islam. You've helped me for 10 years. I, I, re I heard that your daughter's looking for marriage. I will not humbly and politely ask for her hand. His pacemaker would jump out his chest. <laughs> but it's true. His pacemaker would jump. Right? Because we have this problem. And because we have post-colonial constructs about what it means to be beautiful, what it means to be right. You know, even your aunties at home have the cream, fair and lovely. You know what fair and lovely is? It's to whiten your skin because we've got a complex. We've got a colonized mind, people. And even your mother, she has to be fair. That means she's, you know, she's somebody. It's disgusting. I was in Malaysia and they had big billboards of fair and lovely. I changed my talk. The first 10 minutes, I just laid a smackdown on them. I said, you guys are sick people. Because it's part of your culture to think that a color gives you status. Color doesn't give you status. Your heart gives you status. The Prophet said, indeed, Allah doesn't look into your forms and your colors, but He looks into your heart. Do we follow this? Do we, we need to follow this. We need to internalize this, brothers and sisters. Anyway, let me end by saying what I said in the beginning. Another impact of the Prophet is that he based his teachings when they were manifested in Europe facilitate the renaissance of the scientific revolution. According to David C. Limburg, the first scientist wasn't Aristotle, it was Ibn al-Haytham. Ibn al-Haytham was a Muslim, he wrote a book on optics in the 11th century, and it was the first kind of manifestation of a formalized kind of scientific method. And if you look at the autobiographical accounts of Ibn al-Haytham, he was a practicing Muslim and said, the reason he was doing the science, because he wanted to, and I quote, I decided to discover what it is that brings us closer to God, what pleases Him most, and what makes us submissive to His inelectable will. He was a practicing Muslim that was encouraged by Islam to go and look into the sciences, and he was seen as the first scientist, according to historians of science, like David C. Limburg. Interestingly, Professor Thomas Arnold says that Muslim Spain was a milestone to the European Renaissance. And the, the main reason for this, because if you study Islamic Spain, they had, for instance, a convivencia, coexistence of Muslims and non-Muslims to work together, which was based on the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of this, the man of mercy, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And it gave him the freedom to look into the interconnecting principles of nature. Even Jean-Jacques Levesque, who was an artistic critic, he said, when Muslims cross the world, <coughs> don't think that they wanted people's blood, essentially. They were just encouraged by the Qur'an because the Qur'an says, and in the, in the horizons, we will show you our signs in the horizons and within yourselves until you know that this is the truth. They were inspired to look into the interconnecting principles of nature. And Islamic Spain had those social political values that we all believe to be universal. Liberty, justice, convivencia, tolerance. And these were the values that created that society so Muslim and non-Muslim could achieve amazing things in sciences. Look at Musa bin Maymun. Do you know who Musa bin Maymun is? Maimonides? He was considered the second, second Moses in the Jewish tradition. The second Moses. He came from Islamic Spain, he wrote in Arabic. This was Islam. Right? Not the Islam that you see on the news or present it on the news. This was the Islam, the convivencia, the compassion, the coexistence, the progress. And that's why even Adam Smith, he's that guy behind the Queen on the 20 pound note, right? Adam Smith, he's like the modern founder of capitalism. He basically said this was the first state under which the world enjoyed that degree of tranquility which the cultivation of the sciences requires. I could go on and on and on concerning the teachings of the Prophet and his impact in society, even concerning just economics, the distribution of wealth, which we know is one of the key problems of our society. It's not the accumulation of wealth. Don't listen to the neo-capitalists, right? They're liars. Yeah, they're liars. And you know they're liars, because when they say boom and bust, they still happen to be the richest all the time. So you know something's wrong here, right? And as we know, the Food Agricultural Organization, which is linked to the UN, says 
that there's enough calories on this planet to feed around two planets. So the issue is no resources, people. And they even mention, this can happen if we have equal distribution. So the problem of economics is not accumulating wealth. Because man is greedy by nature. Man, not woman. <laughs> man is greedy by nature. And we're going to accumulate wealth. Like the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he said, if, if a man has a mountain, a valley of gold, he want another valley of gold. So the key thing here is distributing wealth. And Islam came to distribute wealth effectively. And there's so many principles that I could talk about, we don't have time. But I talk about one famous leader of the Islamic community, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And this really summarizes the prophetic teachings in the Quran on just economics. He said, O oh people, put wheat on the top of the mountains so the people don't say that we kept the birds hungry. These people are concerned about the birds being hungry. Imagine their fellow man. And that's why Umar ibn, ibn Abdul Aziz would write a letter to his governor in Basra, I believe, in Iraq. And he said, look for the non-Muslims in our society. Look for the people of the covenant, the non-Muslims in our society. If they're poor, feed them, give them from their wealth. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace. What did he say? When there was a famine in Medina, he would walk the streets of Medina and he was caught by this woman and this woman didn't really recognize him. And she was boiling stones or water to keep her children from not crying because to trick the children, make sure they fall asleep because they were really hungry because of the famine. And she said to him, not knowing that he was the leader, I'm going to take to account Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the faithful. I'm going to take to account the leader of the faithful. Upon hearing this, what did he do? He didn't do a PR campaign or block her from Twitter. <laughs> what did he do? He went back to the Bayt al mal the house of wealth. He collected foodstuffs and resources and wealth, and he carried it all the way back to the outskirts of the city to give it to her. And on the way, his servant said, let me carry my luggage for you. And he said, no, you're not going to carry my luggage on the day of judgment. And he went to the house. He gave the food to the point where he even cooked the food himself for them. And he slept nearby, not in his home. This, this was the ruler. He slept nearby. So he could wake up in the morning, so he could see the children smiling. This, is, this was our leadership. We pray to Allah that all leaders in the world have this type of leadership. Because it comes from a heart that has the right tarbiya, that has the right kind of cultivation of compassion and mercy for all people. So to conclude, brothers and sisters, I know it's been a long talk, one hour, 17 minutes. But I thought it was very important because this is about one of the most amazing men to have, the most amazing man to have walked this, this planet. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon whom be peace. He was a man of love, as we discussed, a man of mercy, a man of justice, a man of forbearance, a man of humility, a man of modesty, a man of tolerance, a man of dealing with minorities, a man of compassion, and a man of truth. Because if you study his life, then you know he couldn't be deluded, he could not be lying, he must have been speaking the truth. And to reject that today, brothers and sisters, I want you to take your smartphone and call your mom. And say, mom, I have to reject that you gave birth to me. So I to, <laughs> no, but it's true, I want you to do this. Because I've heard evidence today that it outweighs the evidence you can give me for the fact that you gave birth to me. And I'll end on this story. A few years ago, I was at Queen Mary University, I had a debate with Professor Graham Thompson. After the debate, a very beautiful, his face was like light. Half Serbian, half Greek kid came up to me. And he said to me, I've been reading about Islam and I'm relatively convinced, but I want to know more about the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And then he was, you know, here and there. And you know what? I just became alpha Greek male, yeah? We break plates at weddings, you know? <laughs> and I just said to him, look, I'm going to be very honest with you. Give me your phone. I said, here's my phone. I threw it at him. Call your mom. Because if you reject this man, be intellectually just. Be intellectually just. The logical implication is you have to reject your mother. There's two things you have to do. Either reject your mother or reject the evidence I've just given you. Your choice. So he looked into the evidence. It was discussed more. 
And on that day, he became a Muslim. But what's very interesting as well, is that morning I felt a bit depressed. So after the morning prayer, I made dua, supplication to Allah. I said, Ya Allah, you know, I don't know if this is for me, man, going giving talks, you know. Arrogance comes in, ego comes in, it's disgusting. You know, that's why the pious predecessors were very spiritual. They said, when they did public actions, they knew they would never be accepted because it's public, people see you. The private actions between you and Allah are the most intimate, the ones that are most important. That's why your private actions should outweigh your public actions. So I made dua, I said, please just show me a sign. And when it comes to supplication, there's a few conditions. You have to believe it's going to be answered because it's come from Allah. Some of us don't do it. Think, of, you're not going to answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. Yeah? <laughs> you have to believe it's from Allah and you have to be very specific. So I believed, I just knew it. You're going to do this? And I said, Ya Allah, today after debate, make someone become Muslim. Today, after today's debate. And then after the debate, the guy comes, we spoke, and he became Muslim. And you know what's so special about this brother? This brother called George, by the way. Greek, Yorgos. What's so special about this brother? He's a man of action, not a man of words. And it's very rare to find Muslims, unfortunately. This. He's a man of action. He oozes with compassion, humility. He oozes with dutifulness to his own mother, who's not a Muslim, but the duty that he has for her is phenomenal. And anyway, so I just thought I'd tell you that story. But to conclude, this man's a man of mercy. Follow the man of mercy. Don't reject him. It's like rejecting your own mother. May Allah bless you. May Allah keep you guys united and strong. Be torn with one another. Whoever you are, from that side of the spectrum or that side of the spectrum, politically or religiously, makes no difference. Your students, have a convivencia together, Muslim and non-Muslim. Agree to disagree. Love each other, have this compassion, and God bless Liverpool. <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs>